please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest, Ms. Rebecca Gerzon. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you. What a wonderful turnout. I especially want to extend my thanks to the sponsors uh, uh, of, of this afternoon and the wonderful invitation to be here today, which originated at a talk that I gave up in Boston recently uh, last year. And it was just terrific to be able to, to come along. So thanks to the Center for Health and Humanitarian Systems. I especially enjoyed lunch today with Pinar and Julie. Um, and the Institute for uh, Leadership and Entrepreneurship, as well as the others. So it's uh, wonderful to be here today. What I'm going to, uh, where does this aim? <laughs> hey, it worked, okay. I guess I'll aim it that way. So today what I'm going to do for the next uh, you know, 45 minutes or so, and, and make sure there's time for questions, is to talk about a bit of background on disasters and resilience from my perspective, and I'll explain a little bit more about what my perspective is. Um, I'll talk a, a little bit about how uh, governments and companies respond to disaster, but in particular, IBM. Um, and I'll give you a few examples of disasters, what we've done uh, over the years, and then maybe pontificate a bit on what's ahead. Yay, yeah, so. <sighs> Disasters, um, what to say? You know, they're not very pleasant things. Uh, I don't know how many of you might have been affected by a disaster. Certainly, I grew up in California, and there were a couple of small earthquakes along the way. I managed to escape the large events, but you know, they, they, they affect so much. Um, the disasters that are occurring these days run the spectrum from climate-based disasters, in fact, um, I'm going to refer to my, my notes to make sure I get the statistics right. 87% um, of disasters in 2014 were related to climate. But there are disasters that are man-made. There, are, there is terrorism. There are uh, fires, which may or may not be related to climate. Um, there are earthquakes, which are certainly the sign of the earth, um, the, the, you know, the active earth that we live on. Um, there are cyber disasters. Um, and so the, the field of disaster response is getting more and more complex. And the impact of these disasters is uh, beyond comprehension. So we're all dealing with this. I think that we're all aware of the more extreme weather that's happening and the fact that that is producing situations that are incalculable. So, you know, there are a couple of charts here. There's some good data that comes out of a database called MDAT, which comes out of Belgium. And so I'll give you three sort of snapshots of the, the particular scenarios that, uh, you know, that, that have existed over the last uh, 55 years in terms of deaths, disasters, damage, and so forth. So the d number of deaths from disasters, in fact, I feel like maybe I missed a slide here. Uh, yeah, um, there we go. Sorry, I pressed too hard. So total number of disasters. That's quite a trend line. Uh, you may not be able to see the legend, but the bottom green is Africa. The middle dark blue is Americas. Asia is the yellow. Europe is the light blue. And Oceania is the pink. Uh, that's, that, that's, uh, you can see that this is really a, um, something that is being faced worldwide and is, is, is quite, quite challenging. Uh, the total number of deaths, now actually I'm going to give you two slides on this because that outlier in 1964 uh, relates to a significant drought in India that killed millions of people. And so uh, it's hard to see the, the actual scale um, as a result of that one outlier. But now if we get rid of that, you can see that in other years, uh, the, the number of deaths to disaster is quite significant. Um, there is a... Um, 2004 is the Asian tsunami, 2010 is the Haiti earthquake, 2008 is the Sichuan earthquake in China. Um, 1960, I think that this was um, a drought in Africa. So there, there's a lot of impact out there. Um, there we go. Total cost of disasters, you would expect this trend to be, to be as it is. And you know, the cost is borne by countries that can't, that are low and, and at lower income countries. So for instance, I will say that the loss of human life 
uh, is shown by realizing that 80% of people killed in natural disasters are from low and middle income countries. Um, the, the top five countries for disasters are the US, China, India, Philippines, and Indonesia. Now, several, three of those countries are fairly large in area, so maybe there would be more disasters in a, in a, in a larger um, uh, country. Two of those countries obviously are very small, the Philippines and Indonesia, and yet they are among the top, uh, up to the top five. You know, these countries are on the ring of fire. They are, uh, they are Philippines in particular has 7,000 disasters a year. They are right in the path of typhoons that build in the Southern Pacific and, and head, head to the West. So countries that, uh, you know, these countries get used to something that's pretty hard to, to, to get used to, and yet they, you know, they deal. The Philippines, I have a great deal of respect for how they uh, do their disaster response. Um, a couple of other things to point out. Um, they, as the population grows on the planet, people have always settled where there's water. So coastlines, rivers, lakes, that's normal. As the population grows, the populations in those areas continue to increase as well. And yet flooding is accounting for more than half of the natural disasters. That's because these areas where the populations are growing are experiencing stressors in terms of how the water can uh, get, you know, uh, exist in that space, especially if there's engineering that attempts to change the flow of, wa of, of rivers or, or, or dams. You know, in some ways, that eliminates some of the natural buffer zone that would at one time have been able to absorb some of the water that, that is coming in. In fact, two of the recent disasters we've been, that we've dealt with, uh, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines and Superstorm Sandy in the US, one of the things that's kind of interesting about them, a, a comparison, is that they both were massive storms that happened to funnel right into land formations on the coast that, that acted like a, a funnel from which the water then could not leave. In the case of Typhoon Haiyan, it hit the area of Tacloban, and a, uh, you know, the water surged in, flooded the area, and then could not leave. And it was, it was, it was as if you were you know, shooting uh, from a massive hose at the highest possible volume, the force of the water that came into that area just by virtue of where the storm hit. So as flooding occurs more and more, um, you know, the stressors on those populated areas are increasing. The last thing I will say is that, especially in terms of cost of disasters, countries could invest $8 billion a year annually and save, as a result, about $300 billion annually. So this is the cost of risk management. This is the cost of preparedness, and the payoff is in the form of response. But countries globally are having to reserve $300 billion in order to deal with the effects of disasters that will occur. So it's, it's very hard to, to understand the, the scale and the scope of what we're dealing with. So I've been dealing with disasters for a very long time, kind of watching my brothers you know, mix uh, you know, egg, egg dye. Um, where I came from, how I got here, I grew up in California, as I said. Um, I got a degree from the University of California at Santa Barbara, a history degree. History isn't really a degree that you think of as one that will catapult you to success. And I, it didn't catapult me, but I, oh, all, along the way, I was able to use what I learned with my history degree in terms of how I think, how I research, how I analyze, how I communicate. I like to think uh, that really we're all thinkers and we're all writers, no matter what we do in our professions. That's how we present ourselves. That's how we, uh, that's the impression that people form uh, from us, uh, our ability to communicate, our ability to write, our ability to think. So certainly I gained that from my, um, my background uh, as a, as a, with a history degree. I worked at the Smithsonian for several years. Uh, certainly ten, more than tangential to my history degree, but then I kind of uh, moved away into uh, what I guess I would call production, um, 
in, in a software environment. I went to Spinnaker Software, a small home market, um, one of the early home market software companies. Ended up at Lotus. And from Lotus, I was developing training materials. And I started volunteering at night to teach nonprofits how to use Lotus 123 software, which they were getting for free from the new philanthropy program at Lotus Development Corporation. Several of us banded together to uh, invite nonprofit staff members who were getting this free software and who didn't know how to use it to come to Lowe's facilities, get a bunch of volunteers who maybe weren't very good trainers, maybe we had Xerox copies of training materials, maybe we fumbled, fumbled our way through scenarios and sample spreadsheets, but they loved it. And over a couple of years, we trained several hundred uh, nonprofits. And then the director of philanthropy, who had just been hired, came to me and he said, well, I think we need to bring this in-house. We need to make this a real program. So he hired me to do what I've been doing as a volunteer. So you know, that's, a, that's kind of a cool story, I think. Um, I like the story, <laughs> my story. Uh, and from there, I started, um, d uh, I taught myself to program in Lotus Notes, because that was the platform we were using for all of our uh, enterprise solutions. Um, I created applications that managed volunteers. I created an application that, that allowed employees to um, uh, participate in our workplace campaign. Uh, I created an application that allowed um, employees to get work release time for volunteering. And these were all you know, enterprise applications that people could, uh, could go into notes and, and, and use and you know, tied to back-end systems. So I was self-taught when it came to that kind of programming. So when Lotus was bought by IBM, I had enough technical skills to be able to um, move into this culture from a company of 6,000 to a company of, at the time, maybe 375,000. Uh, qu quite, quite stunning, but it worked. So I got into disaster response about 10 years ago because we were focusing on integrating philanthropy with the business and integrating the business with philanthropy. We were saying to ourselves, as corporate citizenship and corporate affairs, we were saying, what is it that we are doing in our grant making with nonprofit partners and governments that the business could leverage? Can the business, in selling to customers, interest the customers in the fact that IBM has a corporate social responsibility history and a corporate social responsibility set of values and practices that actually says a lot about us as a company? And then what can we, as citizenship, do with the solutions that the business is already selling? Can our nonprofits use those? Can we make, can we make them available as grants to our nonprofits? We decided a long time ago that we don't want to give cash. And we sold the laptop business, so we didn't have laptops to give. So we really began to focus in on how to give our core capabilities, our technology, our expertise, our services, our offerings to our nonprofits. That is the foundation of the citizenship work and grant making. We, 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 um, have, we bolstered that with volunteerism. And then disaster response became something that, uh, that, that really grew. So our view of disaster response and resilience um, by resilience, it is how to improve the ability of a city to adapt. And this city, any city, any population is going to experience two things, chronic stressors and acute events. And resiliency is the ability to withstand that. Now think about yourselves. You know, who had a cold last week? That's an acute event. But who has, you know, um, who, who doesn't sleep very well over time? That's a chronic stressor. Every human being experiences these two things, every city, every organism, every country. Resiliency is our individual ability and collectively our abilities to withstand, uh, to adapt to stressors. So you know, resiliency, of course, relates to disaster because you have an event. You know, there is um, there's a, a big thing that happens. And after the event, there is the response phase. Response is, uh, I'll sort of go into these in a little bit more, but you know, response is, so how do, we, how do we meet the immediate, urgent, critical needs? And how do we begin to, to come back uh, to some kind of level of functioning? Recovery is, how do we restore services and get livelihoods back and get infrastructure back and get housing back? And, then mitigation is how do we do it better so that the next time the disaster happens, 
we have new standards in place, we have prepared, we have allowed ourselves to become more resilient so that it won't be as bad next time. That takes investment, obviously, and that's, that's, that's tough. And then preparation is how do we make sure that people are aware enough of the kinds of disasters that could occur and in some way or another are able to be ready, more ready than they might have been before. So a couple of thoughts on this. So corporations get involved in, in these phases, and I'll talk you know, more about uh, how IBM gets involved in a bit. You know, corporations, a lot of corporations give their core competencies. So um, UPS, they give plane flights to get tents to a flooded area. Their people are on those planes. Their people load the planes. Their people load the, you know, get, get the materials from, supply, you know, from, from other corporations who want to donate. So that's what UPS does. They do that really well as a business, and they do that really well in disaster response. Um, soft drink companies, they will give bottled water or bottled water companies. Um, a Home Depot will give construction supplies. OK, so IBM, well, we are a cognitive computing and cloud platform company. What do we give? Well, this is what's evolved over 10 years, over 20 years. We've actually done 52 disaster responses in 33 countries since 2001. And those have been small disasters, like a mudslide, where the local citizenship manager might mobilize some people, some volunteers, to go help um, run a shelter or the big disaster responses like the typhoons and the, um, uh, and the earthquakes. So 52 of those. And we give our core competencies, we give our technology and our solutions, and we have a certain way we do that. I also want to just mention one thing about cities and how they're looking hard at resilience. This fascinates me. I live in Boston, outside Boston. There is um, a program you may have heard of from the Rockefeller Foundation called 100 Resilient Cities. Has anybody heard of this? Few people, yeah. It's a program that is designed to f help cities, selected cities, 100 of them across the world, focus on resiliency in a new way. The funding includes hiring a chief resilience officer. In Boston, the chief resilience officer is Dr. Atia Martin. She has done something really interesting, and maybe this is being done in other cities, but I, I, I haven't heard of it. She is focusing on how resiliency relates to social factors that make it very difficult for an individual to be resilient. When individuals can't be resilient, communities can't be resilient. And a lot of those social factors, elderly, disabled, people of color, poor people, people who can't access services, um, those turn out, it, those are obviously civil rights issues too. What she is saying is that in order for resiliency to be able to advance in Boston, the conversation about race has to be opened up. So she is f creating a framework in which race as an underlying issue, an underlying conversation, an underlying factor must be surfaced and addressed head on in order for communities to begin to recognize where opportunity is it needs to be improved for the, for the populations that are affected by these social factors. Once that begins to happen, once these civil rights and these opportunities uh, and these divisions are looked at and, and begun to be corrected, then resiliency in a more classic sense can grow. I think that's terrific work and bears watching and is definitely a part of the, you know, as resiliency you know, grows. So, um, if only preparation were easier, you know. So there was a flood predicted. This guy built an ark. You know, he put a lot of animals on it. That's a nice example of, prepare, of preparation, but it's pretty, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not something we can count on. So the stages of disaster. Um, Preparation's at the bottom, you know, preparation is at uh, bottom on this chart. It's preparation is about using what we learned before, using data, using analytics, using modeling to understand what might happen and what the effect will be. Um, predictive tools, um, and that's, that's core to what we like to do, but it's very hard to do as much of it as we would want. Going back up to the top, so um, really the, the response phase. 
during and immediately after, it's where's my family? Where are my friends? Where am I? Where do I get food? Where do I get shelter? Where, about, where are my pets? Um, you know, uh, how, how do I find my, how do I get my prescription filled if I've lost my medical documents? These are the aspects of response which have to be addressed by first responders. Um, and you know, as an example, after the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami in Japan, um, IBM tried to work with, we did work with a couple of the prefectures, the states within, uh, you know, the, the districts within Japan where refugee camps were being set up, looking at how to help the elderly populations um, ensure better health outcomes. Elderly people have a horrible time in refugee camps. They, their health, uh, the, the health declines are so dramatic for elderly people in refugee camps that it's, 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 very, it's very sad. The, what we tried to do, what we created was an e-wellness center that allowed for a, a system that allowed for information about elderly people in camps to be tracked by doctors so that they could specifically target elderly people and try to improve health outcomes. Um, so that was a, a good example of during, uh, of immediately after, um, you know, a, an earthquake part of, uh, sorry, the, uh, the earthquake and tsunami about our response. Recovery is restoration of infrastructure and social systems. After Hurricane Sandy, we worked with the New York City Small Business Services, which is the administration that supports um, small and medium enterprises. And we uh, conducted a series of workshops using our SME toolkit, which is a compendium of information about, uh, for, for small, small, and medium business enter uh, small and medium enterprises to help them um, develop and grow their businesses. So those workshops were uh, made available to hundreds of small business owners over time by the New York City Small Business Services. Uh, mitigation, as I said, you know, re restructuring um, how you do things so that you do it better. We gave a grant recently to an organization in England called Building Resource Exchange. That organization was trying to establish new standards for rebuilding housing because when you have a major disaster and the housing goes away, what do you do? You put it right back up using the same materials, the same codes, the same standards. Sometimes it's even worse because you're so anxious to get something built. So how? So this group was trying to establish new standards that could be applied after disaster. Um, and also in Christchurch, New Zealand, the earthquake a few years ago was so devastating because the city was built on unstable ground and liquefaction occurred. And uh, basically, um, it all turned to quicksand. And the, so what they're trying to do in rebuilding is to establish better um, building uh, practices that allow for foundations to be stronger for the entire foundation of the city to improve. So um, the US government is encouraging resilience, um, FEMA, uh, the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, I also found This example of resilience. Uh, I was looking around online and look what I saw. Georgia Tech defined as resilience. I thought, well, that's, you know, that's that. I read the story, it was amazing. So resilience comes in all forms, right? So what we do at IBM, we practice innovation that matters for the world. This is one of our three corporate values, innovation that matters for our company and for the world. Uh, in the, and what we do is focus on certain societal issues. So I've been talking about disaster response. That is one of several societal issues that we try to address in our grant making, in our volunteerism, in our pro bono service projects, uh, in all of our programs. So those issue areas you see there in the, on, the, on the left, uh, education, workforce development, environment, health, social service, veterans, um, STEM pipeline, youth entrepreneurship and employment. Women are embedded throughout all of this. We, we are looking at all sorts of opportunities for women entrepreneurship. So these are the issue areas we care about. We take our core capabilities, analytics, cloud, consulting, mobile, social, Watson, and then we come up with solutions, such as you see on the right there. I will mention PTECH is a wonderful program. Uh, that stands for Pathways in Technology Early College. It is a grade 9 through 14 model 
that adds two years to a high school program, but that two years produces, allows the, the, the student to graduate not only with a high school degree, but with an AAS in a technology field. And that program comes with uh, not only the high school classes and the community college level classes, but work experience, mentoring. Uh, it's a partnership between IBM, uh, community colleges, and, and K-12. Um, sorry. <laughs> It's that phone. Um, and, but P-TECH started in uh, New York State, New York City, and it is expanding. And by the end of this year, we will have 60 schools using this 9 to 14 model in New York State, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Maryland, Colorado, Australia. So this is a model that is expanding. That's why I mentioned P-TECH, because as an education, as a company that cares about education, this is this is a, a program that is really making a difference. So um, our humanitarian work really does exist across all four phases. I think that where we really shine is in uh, response and recovery. And so I'll give you, let me give you four examples. In response, um, after the Nepal earthquake, a team of IBMers from IBM India went with the government of India, with the representatives from the government, to Kathmandu to work closely with the government there in identifying missing, missing persons, especially Indian citizens who were affected by the border regions where the quake occurred, um, to, to deduplicate data, to cleanse data so that people could be found. And we also immediately helped deploy an open source software package called Sahana. Has anybody heard of Sahana here? I, that's great. Um, Sahana is an open source disaster management application. It was created right after the 2004 Indian uh, Ocean uh, South Asian tsunami, which killed 280,000 people. Um, right after the tsunami, we sent a team of IBMers uh, to various countries in the affected regions. And in Sri Lanka, there was a group of developers, coders, open source um, um, aficionados, some of whom had been with IBM. They got together and they said, the devastation is so bad in Sri Lanka. There are so many thousands of people missing. We don't have any idea how to manage the situation. Nobody does. The government does. Uh, no, the government does not. NGOs don't. Everybody was paralyzed. This group of developers concocted a disaster management application that they called Sahana, which is the Sinhalese word for relief. And it contained a missing person registry, a shelter registry, a volunteer registry, an NGO registry. And they put it together in two weeks. And we were there. We contributed to the requirements. And since then, we have helped deploy Sahana as a free and open source product owned by the Sahana Software Foundation, not by IBM. We have helped deploy Sahana using IBM volunteers in probably a dozen or more disasters since, probably more like 20. So that's what we do in response. We have IBM technology that we deploy as well, but I wanted to give you that one example. Uh, recovery, um, we have um, after hurricane, uh, after the typhoon uh, in the Philippines, we gave a major solution to help them with recovery. And I'll, I'll mention that. I'll show you a slide on that in a little bit. Um, mitigation. Um, I've mentioned a couple of examples already of uh, the kind of work, uh, strategic thinking that really has to happen around uh, mitigation, including the building resource exchange. And, um, uh, and I know I gave you another example, and it slipped my mind. But, uh, and preparation is a little tough. So people have said to me, well, why don't you just deploy these solutions around the world you know, and have them ready? Well, that's a little pricey, you know? <laughs> How do we pick? We, we could pick this city, and the disaster would be over there. And then it's kind of like, well, that was pretty helpful. And we, you know, we, our strategic grant making, our grant making is, you know, we have a budget. We need to give grants that are strategic. We work with partners that we have good relationships with and that we know are ready to receive the, the grants that we offer. Um, so we can't just sort of cover the world with our solutions. That's just not practical. So. The way we do preparation is through grant offerings in our impact grants portfolio that focus on training nonprofits 
in how to prepare for disaster and focus on helping cities do an assessment of their resilience. So there is a, uh, a, a, uh, a UN initiative called the International Strategy for Disaster Risk Reduction, INSDR. And it, ha uh, it, it has uh, produced many, uh, you know, much thought leadership and convenings around resilience. As part of that, um, they have something called the 10 Essentials, the 10 Essentials of Resilience. And you can, you can look it up on the web. There's 10, 10 pillars of how, of how to define resilience. IBM and a company called AECOM created a, um, a resilience scorecard. It's free and open source. And any city can use this scorecard to map their own resilience um, and to understand where they need to focus in order to become more resilient across all city systems and processes. Excuse me. So we have taken that scorecard <coughs> and produced a consulting services grant out of it. We sent a team of IBMers down to Puerto Montt, Chile. It's in the southern part of Chile. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's a port city. It's right against the mountains. Chile, of course, has many earthquakes, tsunamis. Uh, so they asked us to give them this engagement where we would go through a very rigorous process with them to measure their resilience across those 10 essentials. Six-week engagement, um, lots of workshops, lots of engagement with city people. And at the end, they had they were amazed at how we were able to help them overcome the political boundaries that often exist between city agencies and bring people together so that they could start to collaborate around resiliency. So that's, that's a critical part of what, we, what we're trying to do. So our strategy, uh, our activities in our portfolio for disaster response, you know, some of our major events since 2010 are there on the left, maybe kind of hard to see, but it's the Haiti earthquake. Um, the Chile quake, the Japan quake, the Superstorm Sandy, the Chengdu quake, um, Typhoon Haiyan, the Ebola crisis, and the Nepal quakes. And since then, we've been dealing with the migrant crisis in Europe, and we're now dealing with the flooding in Chennai, India, which occurred in November and December. I want to point your attention, call your attention to three things. Impact grant offerings and custom grants, strategic partners and influencers, and IBM volunteers. So um, impact grant offerings and custom grants. Our IBM impact grant program is how we make grants to the world. We made 450 grants last year at, at, with a market value of about $15 million to nonprofits, schools, and governments around the world. These grants range from project management workshops all the way up to strategic plans. Uh, website um, uh, uh, assessments, the urban disaster resiliency assessment that I mentioned, um, and technology roadmaps, lots of different offerings, plus custom grants. So in the case of disaster, um, one of our um, custom grants recently was a mobile application for an NGO in Italy that is dealing with the migrants that are coming on the shores in southern Italy. Uh, so our grants are how we deliver those core competencies and services, including cloud hosting, some of our cloud solutions. Strategic partners and influencers are who we work with. We don't go to a government and say, well, this is what we think you need, because that would be, that's a little paternalistic. We are, we go to those NGOs and governments just like we go to our clients and say, how can we help? What do you need? What, is, what are your pain points? What are you experiencing? And of course, after disaster, who has time to have a long conversation like that? Because everybody who's involved with disaster in, a, in an area is off responding to the disaster. So it's a circuitous route to get to those influencers and those government people and those NGO leaders and those thought leaders and those people who would know how we can help. But we, we're pretty persistent. And it may take us a couple of weeks or a couple of months, you know, depending upon the situation, to really figure out how we can help. But we, but we are devoted to that. Finally, IBM volunteers. Um, so when the migrant crisis was really exploding last year, I heard from a woman at IBM. She said, well, I, my family is a refugee family. I've been working at IBM for four years. I'm from Syria. I'm passionate about this issue. I've done research. I've spoken at the UN. I know this stuff. I have 
just somehow networked with about 100 other IBMers who are also refugees and migrants or have families in that status. And we want to help. And I have no idea what to do. I've got these 100 people. And now they're saying, well, how can we help? And I'm, I don't know what to do. So I said, well, you've come to the right place. So we figured out how to engage these 100 people. We haven't used them all. They haven't all been involved in our projects. But they have gotten involved in creating volunteer activities in their own communities to support incoming refugees and migrants. That's the, that's the focus of what IBM does in supporting volunteerism. Our on-demand community initiative allows people to volunteer the way that they are passionate in areas that they care about. We offer lots of volunteer opportunities that we organize as well, but it's really up to um, the IBM or to figure out what do I care about and how do I volunteer, and that's how we support them. Um, this reinforces what I've been saying. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but you can see there's, there are a lot of external partners and influencers. These are the people we worked with in uh, Typhoon Haiyan, the Ebola crisis, and uh, Superstorm Sandy. And these are some of the capabilities that we brought to the table as well. <clears throat> so now I'm going to tell you about a few solutions that we have, that we have delivered. And so these are some of the case studies. And then, you know, this, this is, um, <coughs> excuse me, and then we'll stop for questions and I'll give my little voice a rest. So after Typhoon Haiyan, we, um, as I mentioned, you know, Taklaban, that whole middle part of the north part of the country was completely devastated. And in fact, what's so hard to realize is that, excuse me, So the Philippines is good at disaster response. They know how to do it. When they saw the storm coming, they created depots of supplies throughout the area that was going to be affected by the storm with food and water and shelter. And then the storm hit, and the, flood, the storm surge was so much greater than expected. And the, where it hit that land mass and got caught, Everything flooded. All their depots were basically washed away. So they're sort of like, well, you know, what do we do now? Because the whole area is underwater, and we can't even get in supplies. So a few things happened. We immediately started talking with them. We had great relationships with the, with the government in Manila. And we decided that what we could offer, and they wanted, was an intelligent operations center for emergency management. It's an IBM solution. It contains, it's basically a, imagine a dashboard fed by data sources. Public data sources, data on hospitals, data on, um, on roads, data on police, data on um, uh, you know, schools, uh, data on traffic, data on water, uh, the, the water supply, the electrical grid. This is all data that can be represented in a, in a dashboard. And imagine that, that that dashboard is a map. OK, so mapping, you know, that's, that's pretty typical these days. But what the Intelligent Operations Center for Emergency Management, or IOCEM, offers is a way for that data to come in on the map, be displayed in different layers, and then be used in a what-if scenario. So you can predict, if before a disaster comes, you can manipulate the assets that you already have in the system. and put in various what if scenarios. What if the flooding is one meter deep? What if the flooding is two meters deep? What if the, what if the storm hits here and not here? How do, you know, how do we deal with this population of people? How do we get them out? What are the, so the what if scenarios, the insights that can be gained from analytics is what makes the IOCEM really powerful. So all of this, uh, this solution is what we delivered to them. And, um, we were able to incorporate into it some communications technology so that right after the disaster, they were able to get out into the field and use a, a and, and marry together the disparate radio and, and uh, various types of communication channels that were all kind of going past each other and competing. They were able to basically marry them into one user interface. So that kind of communications technology right off the bat, and then the IOC for e, uh, IOC EM. Uh, for, for later response and recovery was really a powerful solution. Um, in fact, now I'd like to show you a brief video. So if we could put on the first video, that would be great. I was the 
the biggest or the strongest typhoon that made landfall in recorded history. To be able to prepare for this kind of enormous disaster has been the biggest challenge. And the second challenge is so how to be able to communicate to the public the impact of this severe weather events. Meaning how to communicate to them where to go to appreciate what will happen. Collaboration is the key word when it comes to disaster management. We have to have the common language. We have to develop the common operating picture. For us to have a coordinated uh, work for, um, to manage disasters or potential disasters effectively. In collaboration with our business partners, IBM delivered the IBM Intelligence Operations Center, an integrated system to facilitate better disaster management response. The Intelligence Operations Center is intended to help the Department of Science and Technology plan to respond for significant weather events by allowing them to integrate information from various sources, share that information with relevant national and local government units so that the right decisions can be made at the right time in terms of where to deploy resources, how to evacuate our citizens to safe ground. We can process data. We can simulate also what will happen not only real-time status picture, but also project what will happen after a couple of hours to be able to be prepared for that. Collaborating in terms of sharing information or data that we need, we are able to crunch the numbers and come up with results that could be matched with action. As the planet becomes smarter, more and more objects are becoming instrumented, intelligent, and interconnected, part of the Internet of Things. And this new level of connectedness accelerates disaster relief efforts. A partnership should really be a win-win situation for both parties, and we find this in our relationship with IBM. Cutting-edge technologies will improve our preparedness for disaster. And one of them is IOC. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, whoops. Can we go back to? I'll just I'll just spin through. So let me just give you a couple of other examples, and then we'll stop. We'll stop for questions. So um, that was the IOC. Yeah. It's a fact. Disasters are becoming more frequent and intense, impacting more. Huh. OK. So this is where I want to be. Thank you. Um, so for Ebola, we worked with um, two, we had two major grant um, approaches, actually three. Uh, one is we worked in Nigeria. We gave them a cloud solution to allow their health, uh, public health professionals to collaborate on ensuring that, that, that the disease did not spread in Nigeria. We worked with the UN Mission for Emergency Ebola Response, or UNMIR, to provide them with some data strategy planning because they were struggling to understand data that was available in the three affected countries. And then finally, in Sierra Leone, a bunch of researchers in Africa worked on a solution that allowed people to, uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, in the rural areas to use SMS to communicate, and also a help uh, helpline, but uh, SMS to communicate with officials about their experience with Ebola. We then ran analytics on the data that was coming in through SMS, and we were able to then do two things. One is we were able to um, notice trends in the information that was uh, that that people were expressing their beliefs about Ebola, much of which was incorrect. 
their um, their experience, the you know the the uh, impact on them, and then community leaders and officials, authorities were able to then construct better communications to try to inform the population about Ebola in a way that reflected what what was being heard from them. We also ran an open data jam to try to identify all publicly available data on the web about. Um, about the three most affected countries, data which it turned out that leaders in those countries did not know existed. So um, this open data jam, we actually it occurred uh, over several uh, several events in several cities. Uh, volunteers, open um, people, uh, open uh, government and open data enthusiasts uh, uh, found data and then put it up on a website, and then that data was made available to city uh, to uh, to country leaders. Um, in Nepal, we. Uh, I mentioned that uh, you know we already helped uh, the government uh, of India in Kathmandu. We also uh, have been working and will continue to work with an NGO called Nepal Rise, uh, or Rise Nepal. I can't. Rem I can never remember which it is. Uh, they mobilize community members and especially youth. Um, to serve the communities. This is an affiliate of the Global Peace Foundation, which actually had just held a, gl a global conference of youth in Kathmandu the week before the earthquake hit. They had already mobilized many youth, and they then came to us and said, OK, we want to now train youth to be project managers, to help build shelters, um, to help build um, structures out in the outlying areas. So we then offered um, workshops and strategy planning and, um, and a deployment of Sahana to help the youth track the progress that they were making towards building their required numbers of shelters. And finally, uh, I mentioned in the Europe and my, uh, European crisis, uh, migrant crisis, um, we did a, uh, a custom grant of a mobile app to help Intersos register incoming migrants on the, uh, the southern shores of Italy. And this is an app that is now being uh, granted, re-granted to another NGO that saw it and said, oh, that's exactly what we need. So we're customizing it for them. And we also helped deploy Sahana for the German Red Cross to help them set up a, um, a shelter. Um, our ongoing work and where I think humanitarian response is going, certainly improved coordination is necessary across the organizations that are responsible to their citizens uh, to, to uh, deal with relief and recovery. Um, and you know that coordination is very tough to achieve. Uh, that is where there, there really needs to be some focus. Improvements in data availability, access, and accuracy. Data is it. Data is available through so many sources, but it's, again, siloed. It's hard for NGOs and governments to share data with each other. You don't get a complete picture unless Data can somehow be aggregated and understood, and insights can be gained. <laughs> um, there are lots of wonderful emerging technologies like 3D printing and drones, and crowdsourcing, sensors, wearables. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is a complex system of systems problem that I'm sure you can all appreciate knowing, knowing what you do. So let me stop for questions. I know we're getting a little short of time, um, but I'd love to entertain any questions you like. And I know we have a couple of people with mics who are going to go around. Don't be shy. I can start with a question. I'm just curious about one thing, and well, many things, actually. But um, when you have a natural, let's say you have a, a Earthquake, which is like unexpected, and it is a major event. How does somebody like IBM actually get involved? And in, I mean, how do, how do all these various pieces kind of come together and become coordinated? It would seem to me that uh, you have all these different organizations, uh, different companies wanting to flood in and give assistance, but who, who actually controls this and, and coordinates these activities so they're actually done in an efficient manner? Uh, and so you're asking who who coordinates and controls these activities so they're done in an efficient I mean, you just, manner. You just show you up and say, IBM? i got computers, how can I help? Or is there, is there some sort of coordinating body that you work through to actually launch your initial response when you have these type of disasters? Um, 
That's a good question. So who's the coordinating body? Well, so there, I guess there are two lenses for, that an, for an answer, and just to make sure I understand your question. One is there is no global coordinating body for all of disaster response. That, that doesn't exist, yeah. Um, when we go into, when, so say, the, uh, you know, let's say the um, flooding in Chennai, India has just occurred. And we have, in India, we have a team of IBMers. Actually, many thousands of IBMers are based in Chennai, India. Um, our corporate citizenship manager in India, we have a team of corporate citizenship managers in major markets around the world. I work in the corporate staff, and these citizenship managers each have responsibilities for a country, multiple countries, maybe a, uh, a few states, maybe a state. You know, they, they have a territory that they are responsible for for citizenship work. If the disaster happens in their territory, they are the lead, um, along with an IBM executive, along with maybe um, government programs, along with uh, a sales lead, you know, whoever has the best relationships with the NGOs or the governments that we feel we need to work with, those are the people who then try to contact those people, you know, establish the, the, con the communication around how IBM can help, and then bring in, uh, you know, start those conversations. So, we, you know, I, the corporate team uh, in corporate citizenship and corporate affairs is fairly small. I, um, my, my team consists of me and a consultant and uh, another full-time person who, do, and we all do a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, as you heard in my bio, I'm not just disaster response, but also a center of excellence and, and, and um, I incubate new offerings. So, but I have relationships across the company. And so I borrow people from other parts of the company to work with me on solutions, on response. So right now, for India, I have um, several people from India. I have a couple of people from the United States who are involved who have expertise in a solution that we're planning to deploy. So I'm pulling in all of those team members virtually and, and in a matrixed way to work with us. So, so you're getting your responses from these local uh, corporate citizenship uh, sponsors or directors and, that are IBM employees, is that the way it works? Yes, corporate so citizenship managers from IBM who are in those local territories who give us, they're, they're getting the G2 you know, uh, and, and feeding it to corporate and corporate is feeding them opportunities that might be able to be um, offered to those governments or NGOs. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, I'm Alexander Gothard and thank you for your presentation. I have a question that re relates to domestic issues. So a lot of your presentation really focused on um, international issues. Do you work here domestically with cities, maybe smaller cities, that have disasters, so to speak, maybe smaller disasters? I'm thinking specifically of our Snowmageddon mm. here in Atlanta yeah. um, a few years ago. So what qualifies as a disaster for you all, and do you work domestically with smaller cities? Great question. Uh, you know, your question really gets at how do we choose where we make grants? Um, and that is, so yes, we have responded to disasters in the US. So Hurricane Sandy was one example. Um, and the some other disasters, uh, well, Katrina, we did a great deal after Katrina. Uh, and as I had said earlier, the spectrum of our response runs from small grants maybe for strategic planning to an NGO that needs to uh, be prepared for a disaster or volunteerism after a disaster all the way up to these very large responses. In the US, the US has such strong infrastructure and preparedness already. The US doesn't really need IBM's help. Uh, this, IBM's, you know, cities, cities in the US, generally speaking, are doing pretty fine on their own. In the case of Sandy, it was so overwhelming that we really did step in and contribute where we could. So in some ways, that's why a lot of my examples were from emerging markets, countries, poor countries, countries that are, um, you know, that, that are under-resourced compared to other countries in the world. That's not, uh, you know, th there are many different factors that go into how we decide what the right level of grant support is for any given situation. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good. Went over here first, and then you. Hello. Oh. 
Uh, so my question is based on the idea that you talked about how 80% of the disasters are in either mid to low income countries. Um, so a lot of IBM solutions, I guess, uh, long term solutions especially are technical based. How do you implement a sustainable change in a country where technology itself is a challenge? Um, how do you go about that? Yeah, good, good question. So let's take, uh, let's do a little comparison. Um, and, well, the, the short answer to your question is appropriate technology is, is fundamental. It's right, you know, that, that is absolutely the question. We are not in any way, and we, we, will, we will not dump a solution in a place where it could not be used. Um, grants have to have a term, though. You know, we can't, you know, if we put a, a cloud-based solution, a software-as-a-service solution in somewhere, you know, uh, for, for a government to use, we always put an end date on it. And we say, you know, for two years, you can use the solution. We'll provide you with support for two years. We'll upgrade the software. You know, we give you training right up front. We'll help you optimize it. For two years, you get to use it. In the end of two years, you can decide if you want to continue. And if you want to continue, you do need to, you know, it'll be at, you know, at, at your cost. Um, we would get the business involved if that were the case, and they would continue. So we are completely upfront about that when, when we make the grant. We choose our partners, and we choose the solutions based on the, the partner's readiness to work with us, their desire to work with us, the clear need that they have expressed where they say, yes, what you're telling us you could offer is what we need, you know, true mutual agreement. And then we do the best we can to help them use it, and, and optimize it so that it's effective. And at the end, then, you know, if they want to continue, that's, that's terrific. And if they don't, they don't. So a lot of thought goes into it. And that's, in some ways, why it's so, you know, my, uh, there, there's so much to say about the situation, because every situation is unique. Um, there's no cookie cutter approach to disaster response. <coughs> So uh, my question is uh, dealing with Nepal, actually. Uh, maybe I can sit down here so that everyone can see. Um, what I had learned was that you know all the relief was coming in uh, in that scenario. And the planes were actually being turned away because yeah, they were. Uh, there was not effective coordination and where needs to be uh, things need to be deployed and all that. Yeah. So where does IBM come in? I almost feel like you know that every country can probably make use of some kind of uh, uh, preparedness, yeah. of course, and maybe you can highlight on what would be the next, what are the lessons learned, and where would you want this whole endeavor to go? Uh, because you have UPS, like you mentioned, you have all these different entities who really want to help, and corporations being, you know, richer than many of the countries around the world. You yeah. know, people yeah. look up to the corporations to make a difference. Yeah. So where does this go next? That's really... It's a very good question. I don't, I don't really have an answer to that question. I think, um, you know, there's always a debate about what governments should be responsible for, what corporations should be, you know, what the third sector, the NGO sector should, be, should do. And we want to carve off what is appropriate for a company like IBM to do. And we also want to um, serve areas where strategically it makes sense for us to be there as well. Um, you know, we're a corporation, we have shareholders, we need to be able to justify everything that we do, whether it's business or philanthropy, to our shareholders and make it viable. And in fact, one of the reasons, in my view, why our disaster response work is sustainable is because it is integrated with our company strategy. There is no difference between what we try to do in philanthropy with our solutions to solve the world's problems and what the business is trying to do with our solutions to solve the world's problems. So in that sense, we have to be very strategic and, um, and uh, you know, make the right choices about where to make grants. We cannot solve all the world's problems. Um, we try to, in the case of Nepal, for instance, we, you know, we can't solve the problems of an airport that is turning. You know, in fact, it was a bureaucracy thing. It was there were there were bureaucrats at the border who were turning away relief supplies because they had not gotten permission from somebody upstairs in their chain to to accept those goods, even though the goods were relief goods. It was just insane and incredibly frustrating. We can't solve those problems. You know, we can only solve problems that are, you know, where, where a clear problem statement can be articulated and a solution can be offered and accepted. So, you know, that, that means there are a lot of things that 
are undone. And that's the challenge that the world faces in terms of how to try to help. Um, you know, and sometimes I like to say that these solutions are having an impact far beyond the, uh, the, you know, the immediate scenario because they are teaching cultural changes. The high end, um, the, the Philippines solution taught those government agencies to collaborate in an entirely different way, taught them to think about data in a different way. Um, and that's a cultural change that will only pay dividends down the road. So every bit that we do, if we do it right, will have a positive effect. And, you know, and even though we don't give cash, we feel like what we give uh, you know, in lieu of cash in, in the way of solutions has impact incalculable beyond what cash would be. So thank you for your question. Hi. Hi. I'm curious uh, about what you think is the reason why IBM engages in such uh, outstanding global and local corporate citizenship, and um, while so many other com companies do not, and uh, does IBM uh, do anything to encourage increased uh, responsibility among other corporations? Well, IBM engages in this because it's core to our values. And we have, we passed our 100th anniversary in 2011, and we, that year, we, uh, the way we celebrated it was with a celebration of service. We had volunteer service across the globe all year long. That was one way that we expressed our, our values. Um, our corporate social responsibility accolades are um, clear. We have been, uh, you know, corporate so resp social responsibility, CSR, in c consisting of you know, government, governance, ethics, um, employee well-being, supply chain, environment, uh, citizenship, um, we focus hard on those things. And we have been groundbreakers, pioneers since the beginning of our company in terms of how we conduct ourselves as a business. So um, I think that when we sold the laptop business and we began to realize that we wanted to have more strategic philanthropy that really leveraged our solutions in the world. I think that's when we um, really kind of changed the equation around what citizenship and philanthropy could be. Um, it's not checkbook philanthropy, and I don't think it's soundbite philanthropy either. And so how, you know, I, I, I don't know that we encourage, but we, you know, we're part of the CSR world, and in our interactions with corporations, we certainly, you know, share information and respect what other corporations do. I mean, even when they give cash, cash is still important. It's not what we do, but it's but but we respect what they do. Um, we last year we were awarded by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation the best corporate citizenship steward award of the year, and that was. Um, and two years before that, we uh, we accepted the best uh, disaster response and resiliency program of uh, in for the U.S. Chamber Foundation. So, you know, I think that we're trying to we're trying to live out what we believe is right and if it's it, you know hopefully it's something that is noticed thank you thank you rebecca thanks for coming to georgia tech today thank you very much thank you very much and, uh, thank you